Good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Elmy, and uh, you should see a uh, poll in front of you. And please uh, vote on the poll. Uh, we, we kind of want to get a sense of what our people are thinking about, what our clients are thinking about. And the poll, the poll results, uh, your poll, your uh, choice will be anonymous. And uh, at the end of this presentation, we'll, we'll uh, show you what, what came up. I'm voting, I'm voting right, right, now. right now. And as soon as you vote, hopefully that poll will disappear from the screen. I'm just gonna wait another minute or two while people are voting. But uh, in the meantime, welcome and good afternoon. I'm David Elmy with the Travel Group and Travel Concepts. Feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen uh, to type some any questions you want uh, to ask. And we will make sure that the right person gets that question and gets back to you tomorrow. We have an interesting presentation for you planned. As you may know, we've been inviting speakers, guest speakers from our industry to talk about their ideas about where to travel after we come out of this long hibernation. In some of our past Zoom talks, we've explored what we thought would be good ideas for a first trip from our, away from our region. For example, we've ha we had a talk on family and friends taking over barges and villas in France. We did a uh, a presentation on the Yukon, which has just recently opened up to vaccinated uh, Canadians. And by the way, I believe it has one of the best vaccination records in Canada. And we also had one on Tahiti, which our very own Annie calls an absolute paradise where very few Canadians have ever ventured to. So those are just three of the things that we've talked about in the past on these Zooms, we, which we do once a month. These talks have been recorded, and if you're interested in any of the ones that you've missed, just let us know and we'll send you a link. As I said, today's event is uh, special because we are going to hear from some of our own consultants to learn what they've picked for their first trips. I have to say that I was very interested in this when we organized it, and they, my people have not disappointed me. My choice is London. It's my favorite city in the world. In the past, I've found an excuse to go there at least once a year, and I really do miss it. What's not to like about London? The history, the museums, the spectacular gardens, parks, the underground. I, I, I miss that mind the gap. I, I can't wait to hear that again. And of course, at night, the great theater. I just cannot wait to go back to London. That's, that would be my pick. But Today, I wanna to tell you about an interesting idea that one of my own clients picked. They were searching for a place to escape our winter and uh, they didn't want to do the standard snowbird destinations like at California or Florida or Arizona, which they've been to many times. And so they researched it. And in the end, they chose something I wouldn't have even thought about and that's Bermuda. They found themselves a lovely two bedroom cottage, not far from the ocean with reasonable monthly rates. It turns out that Ber Bermuda has been actively marketing itself to Canadian snowbirds as an alternative to the standard US places to spend the winter. So it's something for us to consider in the future. Why did they pick it? Well, uh, they had a lot of reasons. One was that there's an easy flight connection from Toronto. And uh, they thought about that because if they had to get home to Canada in a hurry, uh, it was just a single nonstop back to Toronto. And so that made them feel very comfortable. Uh, the perfect mild win uh, winter weather was another factor. It uh, doesn't get too hot. I would say it's a lot like our spring, uh, only much drier. And uh, my client told me that there's only a two degree difference in temperature between day and night. They, uh, Bermuda has a great COVID record and a great vaccination record. I just checked that. It has outstanding golf and hiking. And um, as a British colony, it has a culture quite different from the islands of the Caribbean. So if you've been to the Caribbean, this would be quite a different experience, I think. And it has history that goes back to the 1600s. In fact, I got kind of enthralled in reading about the history just to check my facts. and. It's pretty cool. They were involved uh, uh, on the British side of the American Revolution, for example. And it's big, 
big claim to fame, it's gorgeous pink coral sand beaches. It, Bermuda is the most northerly coral island in the world. And finally, it has a outstanding reputation as being very welcoming to visitors. So Bermuda is hands down the most unexpected choice I have seen in my client's book so far as we creep slowly out of the pandemic. Now let's go to one of our, let's go to our travel pros and see what they're up to. First up is Julia Guest. Hi, Julia. Good to see you. Hello, David. Hello. And hello to everyone that's out there viewing us today. Thank you, first of all, for joining us on this warm early summer day. I'm really glad, however, to be with you and to have the opportunity to chat about a place that's particularly close to my heart. Like David, I love London too. And But for me, London is the gateway for my trip because I will be going to England. And I love to find quiet, undisturbed, and somewhat isolated places where the air is still sweet and the crowds haven't come there yet. And truly England's green and pleasant places. The UK, of course, is a very easy place to get to. Uh, several nonstop flights a day will probably be happening when flights are coming back to something like they used to be. And like many of you, I too have friends and family that I like to visit when I go to England. So my trip to England is going to be twofold. So here are my isolated places. First, the Orkney Islands in Northern Scotland. I love to see the Neolithic sites. The second two photographs are taken in the Scilly Isles, the opposite end of Britain, just off the coast of Cornwall. Uh, very beautifully isolated and quiet beaches. But I truly love to visit and discover the gardens, uh, their beauty and the meaning of the gardens, of which there is much to say. But alas, I'm told I only have a few minutes, so I can't tell you everything here. It's my job to plan and escort small groups to visit gardens. And on those tours, we talk about many things. One of them is what exactly is a garden? What constitutes a garden? The well-known West Coast gardener, poet, author, Patrick Lane said, a garden is a real place imagined that with time and care becomes an imagined place real. <laughs> now, some gardens actually tell a story. And this is one that I particularly like. We enter the garden. Oh, first I'll tell you that it was made by the Reverend Parnell, who was a local parson, having a liaison with a local gypsy girl. And his wife was quite wealthy. At the beginning of the 19th century, he was able to employ soldiers returning from the Napoleonic Wars. So labor was plentiful and I'm sure quite inexpensive. And so in this garden, we walk down the pathway to the mouth of the tunnel, which we enter and walk for a few minutes. It's a little dark and can be a little spooky. And then suddenly, like toothpaste from a tube, we're thrust out onto this narrow pathway with very high hedges, uh, dual hedges that we're walking between. And suddenly here is this beautiful pastoral scene of a lake with a lovely cottage. There is a boat there. The purpose of this was because Mr. Parnell's uh, very unfortunate, because she was his wife, was quite portly and she wasn't able to follow him down this path to see what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> and some gardens are full of flowers and who doesn't like to see flowers when they're traveling to visit gardens. And this is a combination, this is four different types of flower gardens. They're very exuberant and multicolored, which I, I think we all love to see at the beginning of spring. And then gardens can be um, very artfully designed as the second garden is that takes into account the borrowed or the distant view. The third is a very paint art painterly artful garden, uh, taking the color of the house into account and only a few colors making it quite striking. And the final garden is um, very naturalistic, very restrained, just a little bit of color amongst the green, taking being more of the uh, prominent prairie gardens, the naturalistic looking gardens that we now have. And then there are the green flower gardens that have 
very little, if any, in the way of flowers. This is like, if you can imagine the rest in a piece of music, the green makes us calm, slows us down and makes us just look at where we are. The third photo in this screen is uh, a garden that looks very Italian. It's not, it's an English garden. And the style of this would have been brought back to England from France and Italy in the days when young gentlemen and gentlewomen would have been sent to Europe to further their cultural education. And that was known as the Grand Tour, today known as a Gap Tour, I'm sure. And finally, I'm often asked about places that I have uh, found and that I have really loved, which is kind of shown here. The first is that, of course, I love the people that I travel with. I love the gardens that I get to see and the people that own the gardens. But I was particularly fortunate some years ago to have traveled with Des Kennedy, uh, also a local well-known gardener and author. And uh, with him took groups to three continents and um, just was an amazing experience to have traveled with him. The second is a garden called Rousham. Um, this is a garden just outside the city of Oxford, which is an 18th century garden, a little bit frozen in time. As you walk down this water channel, which is called a rill, you don't know where you're going. You just follow the bubbling noise of the water as it travels along. It's a very moving place for me. And I'm fortunate I have been there many times and every time it's like the first time. The third is a garden that I came upon quite unexpected in 2008 at the Chelsea Flower Show. And this was a garden that uh, was quite spectacularly colorful at the beginning and came, ended in a very quiet, calm place. It was called From Life to Life, a garden for George. And it was made in the memory of George Harrison. So the story of his life was told through the segments of the garden. So I have to go now. Thank you for joining me. And I'm not going to be going for a while, but I'm certainly loving the anticipation. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Did I hear you say the silly islands? <laughs> Trust you. <laughs> yes, the silly isles are off the, uh, off the west coast of England, off the coast of Cornwall, isolated, uh, therefore never going to be a great tourist attraction because of weather conditions to get there. Incredibly lovely when you fly in on a twin otter or a helicopter looking down on the islands, it looks like the islands of Bermuda and it is just as beautiful. Lovely place, highly recommend it for people that want to get that kind of vacation. You just brought up an interesting point that I hadn't thought of when, when we were planning this. Uh, my pick of course is London, which normal under normal conditions has hordes of people in the museums and other places but am i not right that julia most of the places you're taking your groups uh, there's just not a lot of crowds are there no we stay in small towns generally and even if we stay in a town the city of york um the size of york it we we spend not a lot of time in the town it, we're visiting a lot of private gardens, so we're in someone's personal space and uh, we're traveling the narrow roadways, the beautiful hedgerows in the spring. We're not in the busy, busy places. It is truly the green and pleasant land that still exists if you know how to find it. Wow. So mm. the, the rank and file tur tourists haven't discovered the silly islands yet, have they? So. Thank you, Julia. Our, our, <laughs> Thank next, you. our next idea comes for a first trip comes from Kathy Moore. Kathy's our general manager, and she tells me that she has no doubt where she is going. Kathy, over to you. Hi, yes, no, I, I know exactly where I'm going next. I do have a trip book, but before that, I have to tell you, David, that I promise you, I will find the reason for you to go to London really soon. I'm checking daily because Eddie Red, Redmayne is starring in a revival of Cabaret and he's going to be the MC. and I have every intention of getting a ticket. I've been checking daily since May 21st since it was announced. So I promise you, I'm going to get the tickets and then you've got to find me some uh, aeroplane seats, please. But in the meantime, I have already booked my first trip and it's a river cruise. I've booked a river cruise from Amsterdam to Basel 
And um, river cruising has become one of my favorite ways to travel. Uh, I love the basic inclusions. Every day there's some kind of tour included and, and uh, wine and beer is always included Well, lunch and dinner. But the best part is being able to unpack and for seven or more days travel the world's most ancient highways. Amsterdam is a great first stop. Walking the canal ring with over 400 bridges is just a really great way to get over jet lag and settle into vacation mode. The museums there are magnificent and French fries are really good French fries are common street food. You can easily do day trips from Amsterdam to any city in the Netherlands. Utrecht, Delft and The Hague are all less than an hour away. This time I'm going to Utrecht. My personal top reasons to travel are history, art, food, and to experience the cultural heartbeat of a place, like local street performers and cafe culture. This cruise will check all of those boxes as we travel over 750 kilometers on the Rhine River through the Netherlands, Germany, France, and ending in Switzerland. The Rhine is the most iconic river cruise featuring the Rhine Gorge with over 40 castles on a 56 kilometer stretch from Koblenz to Binion. I'm excited to visit Cologne, Germany, well established from Roman times, and Strasbourg, France, the cultural center of Alsace, and Basel, Switzerland, best known as the city that loves art with over 40 museums. It's been a long time without having my next trip planned, so I'm excited to have this on my calendar. I think there's still cabins left. If you want to join David and I, give me a call. Anyway, thanks for your time. And now back to you, David. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I, I heard a lot about the scenery and sightseeing, but uh, not very much about wine or beer. Do you have anything to say about wine or beer on this, this cruise? Well, I have a surprise beer place for you in, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, serves a hundred uh, beers just locally from the Netherlands. So you'll, you'll be going there and uh, I'll be drinking some of the world's best Rieslings in uh, Germany and the Alsace. All right. That's great. Thank you very much. Let's uh, now let's check in on Debbie gambling. Now, Debbie is what I call a true multitasker without fail. She joins us three times a week on our office Zoom meetings, and she's always out on the beach with her dog, walking her dog and doing the Zoom meeting, which just is amazing. Debbie, where's your puppy now? Hi, David. Uh, Luna is waiting to see where her first trip's going to be. <laughs> and where are you going to go when the smoke clears? Well. Hi, I'm Debbie, and I'm excited to share my first trip plans with you once international travel reopens. It's been a long time since we've had quality time with family and friends, and what I'd really like to do is rent a villa for a holiday get-together with special people I've missed. My destination of choice is the island of St. Martin for a number of reasons. St. Martin's a Caribbean island with a European flavor, divided into two countries with the French side to the north and the Dutch side to the south. There are non-stop flights operating from Toronto and going to this destination, which has 37 beautiful beaches. St. Martin is also largely a tourist destination and has been really severely affected by Hurricane Irma, by cruise ship cancellations, and by COVID travel restrictions. So I'd like to do my small part to help the economy. The accommodation I've chosen is a villa on an exquisite white sand beach in Bay Longa, which is on the French side. I think it's actually Bay Longa. The French could correct me there. On the French side, uh, called the Casa de la Playa. This villa has five bedrooms, five and a half bathrooms, an infinity pool, and it comes with its own private chef. So no one has to go grocery shopping or cook. And it also gives the opportunity to try the, to customize a menu to your choice or to try the local cuisine from your own private local chef. It has an infinity pool and the villa itself is in a gated community with all the accessory amenities and facilities available. 
including all water activities, a health spa, and a gym. If you happen to be lucky enough to go to, to uh, St. Martin for the Monday and Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, that's Mardi Gras. And St. Martin puts on a wonderful, lively, colorful carnival. So that's my choice. And thanks for attending this afternoon. Merci, Dunkerville. Thank you, Debbie. Okay, so St. Martin, you, you picked that because it's a nice, easy flight out of Toronto, I believe. That's, uh, is that's there another of, island? Sorry? That's one of my reasons, yes. Yeah, yeah. Is there another island in the Caribbean that uh, is difficult to get to, that you like to go to? In the Caribbean, I mean, I'm an Aussie girl and I like my beaches. And in the Caribbean, my favorite beaches are at the island of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands but it's such a drag to get to because you have to take two flights to Miami and another flight out. But if you can get there, that's worth it too. All right. Okay. Thank and you. Debbie, sorry. I just said thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And let's go now to the other David in the company, the good looking one, David Powell. David, what are you planning to do for your first trip away from BC? Hi there, I'm David Powell, uh, 25 years with Travel Concepts and five with my pals at the Travel Group. For my first trip, uh, I've chosen Hawaii and more specifically Maui, the island of Maui. Uh, I've been there many, many times. Uh, from the moment that you step off, the six hour direct flight, either with Air Canada or WestJet, you're welcomed by a gentle breeze redolent with the smells of tropical flowers. I look so forward to once again feeling that sun on my face, feeling the white sand between my toes, hoisting a Mai Tai to the Maui sunset, and having some of that beautiful Hawaiian seafood, mahi mahi, ono. Um, we prefer to stay in the South Key area of Maui, which is condo style, but we've stayed in Canapali Beach and um, the more upscale Wailea as well. And most mornings we walk along the beach in Wailea. It's a beautiful, beautiful walk. So um, Maui is my pick. Um, and you never know who I might invite to join me there. So aloha and thank you. Thanks, David. When you talked about when you get off the plane and you smell that tropical air, it just reminded me just now of when I had hair, uh, I, I had to get my hair cut once. Uh, uh, in Maui, and uh, the um, the barber was a lovely lady, and she said she was Hawaiian, native Hawaiian, and she said how that she had once ventured over to the mainland. I think it was L.A., and she said she didn't like it because she said she couldn't get couldn't wait to get back home because she said she missed the sweet smelling air. So even people that live there seem to get it that they get that that unique smell that you have when in tropical islands like Hawaii. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, I caught your point about the six hour uh, flight to, uh, to paradise, by the way. I like that too, that it's a short hop and you're just in a completely different world. So nice pick. David, where's your favorite hangout in Maui? So if anyone's familiar with the show, Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives, I got a place right out of there. It's called the Kihei Cafe. Uh, that's cafe with two Fs for some reason. It's constantly busy, has huge lineups, and serves huge breakfasts. Nice. And there, <clears throat> I don't know who that is who's um, enjoying that breakfast, but. Uh, <laughs> I think I recognize her. <laughs> Thanks, David. 
Thanks so much. Thank you. Aloha. Nicole Peterson is next up. And uh, Nicole, uh, before, you, before you talk about your, your first getaway, uh, Nicole has just started a new company called Soulfly Experiences. Maybe you could just tell us about your new company. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, yes, I started last year with my business partner, Tanel Bolt, and we have a new partner joining us soon, uh, Jason Stratford, who I believe you all know. And we decided that we wanted to launch a travel company that specialized in delivering universally accessible uh, adventure and just amazing experiences so that if you do have an auditory or visual or mobility or dietary or cognitive um, challenge that you can still travel with your friends and family and have an absolutely amazing time. So that's what I'm actually working on uh, this fall that will bring me to my first trip out of British Columbia, which I'm pretty excited about. I think like a lot of you, this is the longest I've ever gone without packing a suitcase, <laughs> which feels wrong. Um, so I will be heading up to Yukon, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, White Horse being only about a two, just under a two and a half hour flight uh, from Vancouver, and there's multiple a day. So um, I will be doing sort of a multi-segment itinerary to sort of catch out the, the whole local flavor and the culture and to see what the local operators up there have been doing to upgrade for accessibility. So that's a big part of our focus. So our first stop will be at In on the Lake, which is a Martha Stewart recommended and award-winning uh, culinary focused lodge owned by Chef Carson Schiffkorn, which you can see from the food pictures there, it's just absolutely amazing. It's also gorgeous and sumptuously comfortable and you can literally sit on the deck and watch the Aurora at the right time of year uh, it's right on Marsh Lake. Uh, then we will be heading up to Sky High Wilderness Ranch, where we will be staying off grid in yurts uh, under the stars with campfires and barbecues um, and going fishing, lake fishing to catch dinner because, you know, it's off grid and there's no restaurants or anything like that. So that's the goal. Um, lots of stars. We're doing a culinary experience with two brewers and Yukon Brewing who do amazing award-winning whiskeys and just delicious um, ales, which I can't taste, but everyone else will enjoy. Um, and then we'll actually be heading over to Whitehorse, which is the culture capital of the North, really, uh, where we'll be checking out the local indigenous culture. We're doing a stop at Kwanlin Den Cultural Center, shown on the upper left here, which is a really amazing place. Their longhouse is just spectacularly gorgeous. Um, and they always have exhibits, they have resident artists, so I'm super looking forward to that. Then we'll head to the McBride Museum, which just does an amazing job of showcasing the really pioneering spirit of the people who went up there who were non-Indigenous and made the place their home and really changed it forever. So we know about the gold rush, but the story is so much larger than that. Uh, and then we will be heading over to Lumel Studios for uh, what they jokingly say is the best blow job in Canada, where they will teach me to blow glass. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, they are known as the happiness factory locally. And then actually my last night in Yukon, I will be staying uh, in an authentic at the Parks Canada site at uh, Kalani National Park which is home of Mount Logan, Canada's uh, largest mountain, and just some of the most uh, breathtaking and spectacularly serene scenery, freshest air on earth, um, stars as far as you can see them at night. Um, so that's the thrill is just to really unplug and disengage and re-engage. Thank you, Nicole. That sounds fantastic. I know, no, I know I wouldn't be forgiven if I don't ask you this question. When is the perfect time to go to see the Northern Lights? Um, great question. Uh, in Canada, we actually are really privileged to have the longest Northern Lights viewing season in the world. So really, as long as there's dark sky, if you are in our Northern Territories, particularly the Yukon and Northwest Territories, you will have a very good chance of seeing Aurora. So they do come out uh, really anywhere from middle of August to middle of May. So I will be there in mid of September and I'm, I'm, I'm holding out hopes. That's great. Now that was everybody else's question. My question is, when do you go to avoid the mosquitoes? Um, just don't go right now. 
<laughs> I just was talking to some friends up in Whitehorse today and they were uh, one of whom just got married yesterday and they actually uh, relocated uh, part of their wedding plans to inside of a wall tent uh, that could be basically kept mosquito free. So yeah, no, they'll eat you alive at this time of year. I would strongly recommend uh, really after the middle of August is a great time to go uh, sort of that middle of June to uh, to beginning of August can can be a little hungry. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Julie, are you there? I am indeed. Hi, Julie. Hello. It's good to see you. Rumor has it that you're going somewhere a little further right. away. Am I right? I am. I am indeed. My first trip, thank you for coming everybody or listening in, I should say. Um, my first uh, post-COVID trip will be Australia. I'm going to fly on the wonderful Air Canada Dreamliner nonstop to Sydney, hopefully in business class. Um, I will then spend, or we will spend the first week generally touring around Sydney, doing local day trips, perhaps taking the Blue Mountains and with my new hip, perhaps I'll be able to climb the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So I'm then looking forward to doing this little six kilometer beach walk um, from Coochie to Bondi Beach. Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> um, then I've always wanted to go up to the Barrier Reef and do snorkeling. So we will fly up to Cairns, which is the gateway to the Barrier Reef, and hopefully book a little snorkeling trip and just general sightseeing around the area. We will then take a Virgin Australia flight, that's the inter-Australia flights, to over to one of my favorite cities, Melbourne. We're going to spend a week dining, art gallery, uh, shopping, just a great European feel of a city. It's one of my favorites. So after that, we'll rent a car and we're going to drive down to Torquay, southeast of Melbourne in about an hour and we will take in the Great Ocean Road which is one of Australia's national heritage sites. So we'll take a nice little drive and hopefully book a nice little beach cottage, um, throw a few shrimps on the barbie and open a few tinnies which is beer in Australia terms and just have a nice week of relaxing. So we're really, really looking forward to that. And then we will fly home. Thank so that's you, my little Julia. Trip. It's short and sweet, but we're really looking forward to it. I love Australia. Thank you so much. Now, uh, can you tell me something? Are you just, um, I know Air Canada flies nonstop to Sydney, Australia. Are yes. you just flying in and out of Sydney or what are oh, you doing? No. We're doing an open jaw and for, the audience that perhaps don't know what an open jaw is, you fly into one city and you fly out of another. So you're not trekking right back. Um, Air Canada does have nonstop flights from Melbourne to Vancouver. Whether or not they'll still have those after the COVID, I don't know, but that's what we're hoping for. Perfect. I see they they're they're flying nonstop to Brisbane as well, but we're watching yes, of to see course if they, they are. Yes, yeah. yeah. We're just but hoping the, they put that Melbourne flight back on. Yeah, but those Virgin um, Virgin Australia is a great little local, well, not a local airline, but a small airline that does very cheap flights within Australia. So that's a great way of getting around Australia. It's it's fabulous. So that's what we'll do for the for the into Australia flights. And of course, you'll be tipping everywhere, will you? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we know about the Aussies and the tipping. No, exactly. No, the Canadians do. But yes, yeah, really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now, let's you. check in on our own Mackenzie McMillan. Mackenzie, how you doing? Hi. Where are you going outside <laughs> this country as soon as you can? 
<laughs> well, thanks for that introduction, David. Uh, hi, everybody. I hope everyone's enjoying this webinar and starting to dream about all the possibilities ahead as we begin to return to normal and prepare to spread our wings and fly. I, ha I have to admit that cruising is not usually a style of travel that I gravitate towards. So it's kind of funny that I'm excited to talk about a cruise for my first trips. Not to impugn your standard Caribbean cruise, but this is not your parents' tropical vacation. This is a cruise with a ton of amazing ports filled with spectacular cultural experiences and absolutely fantastic food. The cruise is a circumnavigation of Japan in the fall of 2022. I'm just picturing experiencing so many parts of this amazing country just as the leaves begin to change color. So beginning in Tokyo, one of the world's largest and most culturally significant cities, We'll set sail aboard Celebrity Solstice and head south, stopping in Mount Fuji, Kobe, and an overnight stay in Kyoto before heading to Hiroshima. Then around the south of the island and over to Busan, South Korea. From Busan, we head to the north, stopping in Hakodate and Aomori before returning to Tokyo. There's a lot of things I love about this itinerary. One of them is that it starts and ends in Japan. So you don't have to worry about starting in China or in Hong Kong and worrying about being in a different country. Um, but the biggest thing I love about this itinerary is that it's extremely port intensive, giving tons of opportunity to experience the countless UNESCO World Heritage Sites, especially in Kyoto, Hiroshima and Aomori. The Fushimi Inari Shrine in Kyoto, honoring Inari, the Shinto god of rice, is really high on my personal bucket list. With the Senbon Tori, or thousands of Tori gates, uh, being a trail that is covered by a seamlessly, seemingly endless collection of Tory gates. You know how you sometimes see a photo from somewhere and you can't stop thinking about what it would be like to actually be there? That's the feeling I get when I see photos of this incredible display. Beyond the sites, the history and culture is, of course, the food. It's not just sushi in Japan. I can't wait to sample some of the local specialties, like okonomiyaki, which is a Japanese comfort food, kind of like a savory pancake. Uh, that is very popular in Hiroshima, and not to mention all the different types of ramen, which are very popular in the north. Japan has always been extremely high on my list of places to visit. I can't believe I haven't been there already. And getting a chance to see so much of it, with a little dash of South Korea thrown in, is very exciting. Now, aside from the amazing destinations, traveling with celebrity cruises is also high on my list. They're innovative vessels, gorgeous cabins, and their list of inclusions, which include uh, complimentary Wi-Fi, um, prepaid gratuities, and of course, your basic beverage package, something that you don't see a lot on uh, mainstream cruise lines. But this definitely puts celebrity right up at the top of that list. And the Solstice is no exception. It's a beautiful ship. It's modern, it's sleek, but still pretty classy. Uh, it even has a real grass field on um, the top deck, so you can enjoy a nice picnic or maybe even a little Japanese bento box. You can even take a glass blowing lesson. So sign me up, I can't wait. And I'm hoping that I can bring a bunch of some people with me too. We're holding cabin space uh, for a group on October 2nd of 2022. And I really hope that other people will be able to come enjoy this with me so I can share how amazing, beautiful Japan is. Thank you, Thank Mackenzie. You. <laughs> Kathy and I did, uh, did a cruise similar to that uh, about two years ago. And it was one of the best vacations we've ever done, we've ever done. It's just, just uh, Japan. I, I'd go back in a in a second if I had Absolutely. the chance. So thank and you know they say, and you know they say Japan, uh, specifically Tokyo, is quite expensive. So this is a great way to be able to see the entire country without having to spend the um, very, very expensive prices for hotels in Japan. And I, I think you mentioned this this uh, city uh, uh, in your presentation, but you corrected me the way I've been pronouncing this all my life Kobe is not pronounced Kobe at all is it Kobe Kobe yeah <laughs> thank you for that you should hear how I used to pronounce San Jose San Jose <laughs> <laughs> Mackenzie I know you all too well and yep. I'm sure there I'm positive that there's somewhere closer to home that you're planning to hit as soon as possible tell there us where be, it is there might be well, given that we've spent 14 months socially distancing and avoiding people, I am actually going to a music festival with 90,000 people at it 
uh, in Las Vegas. I'm going to the Life is Beautiful Music, Art, and Culinary Festival in mid-September. So uh, once I get my second dose of my vaccine, I'll be good to go. Wow. Absolutely. So arigato and sayonara, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Mackenzie. Thank you. We have time for one more idea. And I thought, why don't we talk to our friend, Cindy Horton? Hi, Cindy. Hello, everybody. I have a feeling you're already out of town, it looks like. Is that well, true? Well, I am, actually. The background is I'm in my daughter Chelsea's home in Nanus Bay, and um, we're having our first hugs. <laughs> so we're already on our way. We're double dosed. We spent a couple of nights at the Oak Bay uh, Beach Hotel in Victoria, which was outstanding. And which, by the way, we have some very good rates uh, at if you're interested. So yes, I'm already traveling and uh, can't wait to do more. That's for sure. Great. Where's your first trip going to be, Cindy? Well, you know, I have to tell you, David, <laughs> when you came up with this idea, what instantly came to mind for me was Northern Italy. And we had visions of a small car and a huge picnic basket and time to just explore the lakes, have some beautiful cheeses, some wines, visit villages steeped in history and just sort of take a very gentle re teacher travel. But <laughs> if I'm being really honest, the truth is I would go anywhere on the continent of Africa in a heartbeat. And that's really where my heart still is. Uh, I realize it can't be a first trip for anybody because of the current situation. But the truth is, dreaming is really what travel is all about. And so I really encourage everybody to dream, think big, open your heart, use these, these travel experiences to really learn about other people, other cultures, make friends and make the world a better place. Um, I've been lucky, my, lucky enough myself to visit six countries in Africa, um, and I still think the East African countries are the best bet for your first trip, there's no doubt about it. The first time you visit Kenya and Tanzania, your heart will just sing, and you will come back with memories that last a lifetime, not a year or weeks, but a lifetime. Uh, if you can imagine waking up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning and climbing into the Jeeps with a mug of coffee or tea and warm biscuits, whatever you like, and uh, you head out and watch the animals come out of their resting place and look for food for the day. And that usually takes a good couple of hours, sometimes closer to three hours. And then you're back to the camp for a big breakfast and you put your feet up, have a little bit of a rest. And then typically in the afternoon, you go out and visit a village or have a little chat about sustainable travel, you learn about the, the area that you're in right at that particular moment. And typically people move around on safaris to different camps because each camp has a plethora of different types of wildlife. So what we choose for you is usually uh, booked around the interest that you have in the wildlife that you want to see. Um, after you're out in the afternoon, you go for another drive, and that's the sundowner drive. And this is when the animals are heading back to their resting place for the day. And typically, if you are lucky enough to see a kill, this is when it will happen. And uh, that is really a spectacular sight. And if you can imagine your driver guides kind of getting, you can see them starting to twitch. They're so excited. They know that something's going on. And they'll stop the, the van or, or the vehicle, the Jeep that you're in, and just stop and take it all in. And sometimes it takes as long as an hour for the whole thing to unfold. As the kill begins to take shape, the animal goes down, the other animals feast on it, the birds come in, they clean the kill, and then suddenly it's total silence around you. It's an absolutely spectacular experience. And after that, you're back to your safari camp. And typically a beautiful big dinner, sundowners around the, around the fire. It's a chance to just chat and talk about what you experienced that day. Absolutely spectacular. The accommodations on safaris uh, don't vary a huge amount. Um, they are all built from local sustainable materials. So you'll find that everything from the very comfortable camps to the, to the more modest ones are still built from local materials. They take a great deal of pride in that. They all have big open decks, so you can see out as far as, as, far as the eye will take you. Um, of course, getting there is part of the fun, and I can't, unlike my colleagues, tell you that it's a simple flight and you'll be there in a matter of hours because it's at least two overnight flights to get to the continent of Africa, at least two overnight flights. Most people break it up with a stop in London or Amsterdam on the way, and that's kind of fun. Uh, and then you have your connecting flight. So 
the picture that you're looking at now, the slide on the left is one of my favorites from all my travels. And that's on a flight that we were just getting ready to board in Kampala, heading to Bwindi in Uganda to go gorilla tracking. And that's the female pilot filling the gas tank with, with a jerry can. Uh, that was a great experience. The, the planes that they use now are highly upgraded. There's no doubt about it. And there's even some jets actually that move into Uganda. So things have changed a bit for sure. On the slide on the right, um, it really gives you an idea of how important the vehicles are that you use that you're on when you're on safari. You want to make sure that they are totally wide open, that you're not popping out of a roof and, and that your views might be obscured. So we're very careful to take that into consideration. If you are able to hike in the heat and uh, you can deal with elevation, then I really cannot recommend a visit to Uganda or Rwanda to visit the mountain gorillas. It is truly another life-changing experience. Um, they're very well orchestrated. So you have to purchase the, the permits usually about a year in advance. And they only sell, in the case of Wendy, 24 permits a day. So you go off in a group of eight, you're divided into a group of eight, and you have no idea how long it's going to take you to get from the base camp where you start to actually see the gorillas. Now they do go out all night, so they have an idea of where the families are and uh, they could head off in the right direction. But in one of our treks, it took at least four, maybe even closer to four and a half hours to find them through very hilly mountainous terrain. Um, and on another one, we actually found them in about a year and a half, in about an hour and a half. So it does vary, but it is absolutely worth the experience to look into the eyes of these gentle giants that are over 99% same DNA as, as the humans and watch them play with their families. So if you can imagine the babies rolling down the hill and jumping into the arms of their mother and then just stopping and eating with these great huge silverbacks in the background, taking it all in and feeling safe the whole time, it's extraordinary. So I really recommend if you do do this that you, buy pur you purchase some permits for at least two days. And the reason for that is the first experience is so overwhelming and so exciting and so exhilarating that you're, you're absolutely hardly know how to deal with yourself. You want to make sure that you catch everything on film, that you get lots and lots of pictures, um, but it's over all so quickly. But on your second visit, because you've already gone through that, you've taken some great images, you have the chance to really just stop and enjoy these families enjoying the best life that they have. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Uh, the mountain gorillas are actually tucked into uh, three corners. Uh, they're in the corner of uh, the DRC, the, uh, the Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda. So there are three places that you can view them, two safely, <laughs> that's Rwanda and Uganda. Uh, and uh, this last image that you're looking at is um, a group of women that I viewed the gorillas with on my very first trip there. We're lifelong friends now actually, still get together for weekends. And that is a picture of a trip of a lifetime. So I wish you all the best, dream and get out there. Thanks, David. Wow, uh, Cindy, that's really inspiring, thank you. Uh, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but so far when I'm listening to all these travel ideas, I don't think anyone else has mentioned, has used the words, and if you want, a, a chance to see a kill. Right. <laughs> I don't think anybody else has said anything quite like that. Like that. That's, that is brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, before we, we're, we're all done, but before we go, I want to thank Colleen Maxwell, who's put this all together. She's the brains behind this outfit. And uh, Colleen, are you there? Hello, yes, Hello. I'm here. Why don't you tell us where you're hoping to go when you leave town? Uh, well, that's an easy one. Pre-COVID, uh, my mother and I had a trip planned to Iceland, which has been postponed. Uh, so that will be my first trip, my first big trip. Uh, we, I feel like it's a safe place. They are currently accepting fully vaccinated travelers and they haven't had a COVID case in over a month. So it's, uh, it's some, a, a safe place to go. Um, I'm excited to go because of the wide open spaces, the nature, the ice caves, the waterfalls. And you may have uh, seen in the news in mid-March that there was an earthquake eruption and it's near the city. So you can do a day trip out to see that. So that would be pretty cool. Of course, there's the hot springs, the Blue Lagoon, which is the famous one. And it wouldn't be a trip to Iceland without seeing some of those fuzzy Icelandic horses. So. I'm definitely looking forward to 
booking that and uh, and getting there pretty soon. Wow, thank you, Colleen. Uh, uh, I know we have two Iceland experts working for us, but I I bet you've already tapped into them for advice, haven't you? Always picking everybody's brain. Yes, good, good. Uh, I know you'll you needed to remind me, but you you didn't need to remind me. I think it's time to look at the poll results. So you guys probably filled out this poll early on. So let's see what we got here. So it looks like the majority of people are looking focusing on spring in 2022. Not a surprise. And where will the first trip be all over? Oh, or what kind of first trip? I'm sorry. Adventure. Now that's great. That, that is really, that's really a good one. And I'm trying to get my notes up here because I want to say, there we go. I wanted to say goodbye. So before we go, any, any of you uh, have anything you want to say before we wrap up? Anybody else have anything to add? No. I'm excited to get out there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so thank you everyone, first of all, from the Travel Group and Travel Concepts for sharing your ideas with our wonderful friends and clients today. I know everybody's itching to travel and that's one of the reasons we chose this profession. But even more so, we can't wait to tackle some of the interesting plans that you, our clients, will be pitching at us very soon. I tell my colleagues in the travel industry that they have chosen a noble calling. We believe that travel breeds tolerance and understanding, and that's something this world needs more of. What, and whether you're booking a business trip or planning a special vacation, travel agents help people experience other cultures and see the world from different perspectives. And I think the same can be said for you, our travelers. You too can be an agent for positive change in the world. So we cannot wait to get you all back on a plane in somewhere interesting. As we come out of this long period of lockdowns, quarantines and closed borders, I am so grateful to my colleagues who have remained committed to their wonderful profession. Every day I rely on their advice and it's clear to me that by this great turnout today that you value them as well. Their advice and expertise are priceless. As the song goes, it's been a long, cold, lonely winter, but the sun is rising again on the world of travel. And why don't you consider calling up your, cons your travel consultant this week? I know they'd like to hear from you and who knows, maybe you'll be inspired to plan your first adventure. Thank you again for joining us and have a good evening and everybody can wave goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.